Well, here we are for the next lecture. This one is about mammals, and you saw a bunch of cool mammals in the introductory video, including some from my cabin. Mammals of close are the, as close as we've gotten to ourselves from an evolutionary perspective. And so now we're going to be talking about some of the features that really make us what we are, in addition to the gradual increase and addition of all of these other things we've learned about so far. That's a, a, um, a leopard in Africa that was trying to sneak up on some uh, impalas, but uh, failed to do so. It was spotted by one of them and, and it kind of gave up soon after this. Mammals have about 5,000 species, and as I said, they've got these three sort of major things that make them unique. And those include hair, sweat glands, and mammary glands for milk production. Other animals don't have these features. Now, I'm not really going to spend any time talking about sweat glands or mammary glands for milk production, but I did want to spend a little bit of time on hair. So hair presumably initially evolved for the purposes of insulation but it's subsequently been co-opted for a variety of other purposes, much like feathers have been in birds. So for example, in addition to insulation, they're often used for camouflage, as you saw in that leopard in the previous picture. They're also used for sensory uh, functions, such as the, the whiskers of many animals, and also for defense. Probably the most obvious example of defense is the evolution of quills, such as in porcupines. This is an African porcupine, but of course we have uh, quills in North American porcupines as well. And quill-like structures have evolved multiple independent times from hairs within mammals, including in hedgehogs and also in echidnas. Now another thing that hair has evolved into are the horns of many animals, such as the impala that that leopard was trying to uh, attack. Now those are different from antlers. Because antlers, like you saw in the moose at the start, uh, in the starting introductory video, are basically extensions of bone. So they're, they're bony structures. And the moose, of course, grows these every year, as male bull moose do, um, to display to females and to also fight with other males. And then they get rid of them when the winter comes. As you saw that one moose trying to shake off its, uh, its antler during the, as it was running along, it almost fell down. So we're here in this part of the evolutionary tree where you had the branch we've already discussed that went off to reptilia and to birds. And now you have an earlier split here after the evolution of the amniotic egg where one half of that, not one half, but part of that lineage went off to form the reptiles. The other part went off to form the mammals and you see the evolution of lactation and fur, hair uh, on those mammals. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of mammals. So uh, the true mammals in the group with hair, um, mammary glands, those evolved about 225 million years ago in the Triassic period. Now the original mammals were sort of small, shrew-like animals that kind of scurried around, were probably insect eaters, uh, like these shrews. So you see a modern day elephant shrew up here, and if you look at old fossils like this 195 million year old uh, fossil of a shrew-like uh, mammal, uh, and it also has something I'm going to discuss later, which are changes to the middle ear bones, which are derived from the jaw and are become, going to become the things that we do our hearing with. So here's just uh, one thing I found recently that just shows the evolution of how some of the jaw structures, which of course originally came from uh, the pharyngeal gill supports or gill arches, have become uh, gone from the jaw and evolved through the lineage of mammals into middle ear bones. And they're the things that um, vibrate when our, when our eardrum moves. And so therefore we have nerves that connect to them which translate those vibrations to our brain which interprets them as sound. So those came from the middle, uh, from the jaw bones. Now if you look back at the mammals that lived during the time of dinosaurs, that is before the major radiation of mammals, and at their very origin, you would see that they did indeed coexist with the dinosaurs, so the saurs. Uh, and they only became the dominant group when those saurs went extinct, about 65 million years ago. And then after that they diversified and filled a whole bunch of empty terrestrial and marine niches including generating large herbivores and carnivores after the dinosaurs disappeared, thereby presumably opening up an ecological opportunity for the adaptive radiation of mammals to fill a whole much greater suite of niches. 
This graphic is attempting to describe some of the features that mammals would have had during the time when they coexisted with dinosaurs. So for example, you had some really cool uh, gliders that were occurring at the same time with the dinosaurs. Uh, but then you also had the evolution of a sucking and swallowing modifications to the hyoid bones. And this also tells you that basically these early mammals were indeed suckling milk from the teats of their mothers. And so here's a progression of the changes in the hyoid bones through evolutionary changes that led to modern mammals that are really good at sucking milk as juveniles. And so here, Ambulocetus is suggested to be one of the ancestors, or the main ancestor, to modern whales. So these were found about 50 million years ago, or about 3 meters long, and they have a number of anatomical features that suggest a kinship to the whales, and therefore, if they're not the actual ancestor to whales, they're a close cousin to the ancestor of whales. Dolphins and killer whales, which are dolphins, basically evolved uh, from the group that includes things like cows. But then walruses evolved from within the group that is uh, shared with the carnivores, whereas things like the manatee evolved from um, things that were similar to elephants. So you have multiple independent origins of the return to the marine environment uh, from a originally terrestrial form. We also have an exhibit about back to the sea, which is about a bunch of different evolutionary origins of return to the sea from a formerly terrestrial life. There are many places where you can go and see these cool marine mammals. You can watch whales. Uh, you can go whale watching in many places. Many whales are on rebound, whereas uh, from uh, industrial whaling uh, after the ban on whaling. Uh, but also you can see many cool marine mammals. These are elephant seals in Año Nuevo the same place I showed you the pictures of the cookie cutter shark marks. And so I just think it's kind of funny because uh, this particular elephant seal was just kind of hanging out in a pool of water and basically breathing right on the surface of the water. After the dinosaurs went extinct, you had a rapid expansion of these different mammal groups to the point that now, the time we're in now is kind of called the age of mammals. So basically from the extinction of the dinosaurs until the present time. And even if you go back just to the Pleistocene times, you had a whole bunch of mammal forms that were these incredible, weird diversification of all these massive mammals that we do not see today. So they're all extinct. We know a lot about this time period because there are a lot of really good fossils. And you also have collections of fossils from single places, such as uh, revealed by the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles at the Page Museum. Los Angeles was originally basically a place for oil extraction because there's a lot of oil near the surface there. And if you look at old pictures of Los Angeles from 100 years ago, you just see these oil derricks completely covering the entire area where Los Angeles City is now. This tar was near the surface and it basically trapped a lot of animals. So here are some um, mammoths here who have been stuck in the tar. This is a, obviously an exhibit outside the museum. I do have to say that this is the coolest thing in Los Angeles. So if you're ever in Los Angeles, make sure this is your top priority to go to the Page Museum and look at these exhibits. Now, our understanding of Los Angeles at that time period, so 100,000 to 15,000 years ago or so, uh, comes a lot from all of the animals that got stuck in this tar. So when animals got stuck in it, other animals would go to feed on those animals, and then those animals would get stuck too and die. So in these tar pits, you have just jumbled, piled masses of bones that they dig up. And it's really spectacular. So let's talk about some of the animals that have been revealed to be present during this time period. And let's start with Megatherium, the guy on the right, which is a giant ground sloth, which bears a kinship to modern sloths, such as the three-toed sloth you see on the left there. But they were much, much bigger, the size of elephants. Sloths the size of elephants. They died out about 8,000 years ago, so they're present from 2 million years ago to about 8,000 years ago. Now, something I learned really recently that's super cool about giant ground sloths, which has only been really discovered recently, is that they have, they built huge burrows through soft stone. It's not clear why they did this, but in South America, there are a whole bunch of places where you can go and see the remnants of these long caves and tunnels and burrows that were 
uh, built by these massive ground sloths. This saber-toothed animal called Smilodon. Uh, they were present about 1.5 million years ago to almost 11,000 years ago, so they coexisted with people, with mammoths, with giant ground sloths. And they had these massive front teeth, which were probably used for uh, stabbing, for example, the throats of some of the animals. And they had, uh, those things were so long that in order to bite anything, they had to have an evolution of a wider opening jaw, because otherwise they couldn't get anything in their mouth. You had all these crazy, diverse, um, exceptional animals running around up to 11,000 years ago, or even later, 8,000 years ago. Where'd they all go? Why are they not here now? There's lots and lots of evidence that these large megafauna, which had evolved without humans present, really were incredibly susceptible to humans and the modern tools they've used for hunting, including things like the Clovis Point uh, and other innovations that humans had when they came into North America, which essentially is thought to be one of the primary factors wiping out these uh, megafauna. A couple of times I've mentioned the Red Path Museum at McGill University where I have an office. Now the director of the Red Path Museum, Professor Hans Larsen, so he lives very close to me and I've decided to invite him over into my garage and he's going to give us a little description of mammal teeth and how they work based on a large collection of skulls which I happen to have here. So this is just a quick heavily edited version of a really cool 20 minute piece that I suggest you check out on this YouTube channel here. Uh, it's really awesome, but not required for class. Hans Larsen, director of the Red Path Museum at McGill University. So the, the really cool thing with mammals is that we have super complex teeth. All the incisors, all the canines, all these premolars and molars, every tooth is, is, so, is so discreet. Um, and one of the key features of all mammals, if we go way back in time, like 250 million years ago, is that they have canines. And canines are one of these key innovations. Like it's the it's the thing that got, that really kickstarted mammal evolution. So here here's the canines, and you can see the canine is sitting at the very front of this bone. This bone is called the maxilla, and here's the premaxillary bone. In the case of a deer and and a lot of a lot of like really advanced herbivores, they have no teeth even on the front of the jaw. So they have basically just like gum. So they have a gum on the front with these tiny little nipping teeth on the bottom that press up into that gum. And then when they, when they get to the back of the jaw, they have these like really complex um, scissored-like or very, very, very sort of tightly uh, seesawed um, teeth that just go crunch, crunch, crunch and pulverize um, plants. Here's, a, here's, here's an animal that eats exclusively grass. Really, really uh, dissected teeth. So incredibly complex teeth. And so as they're chewing, that sort of complex, um, sort of jaggedy edge tooth meets another jaggedy edge tooth and they just grind up and grind uh, their, their, their grasses. To, to start with a carnivore, let's start with a wolverine, because this is the extreme. There's, there's nothing more carnivore than a wolverine, and, and I, I can explain why. This is more like the normal condition where it's taking all its teeth and lined them up in a row. Here's a wolverine, it's actually taking that tooth and turn it sideways. And the, the adaptation for that is is partly for just crushing. This is where the lower jaw fits in. You can see this big sort of paddle of bone. This locks the jaw in. So this animal can bite down with tremendous force and never dislocate its jaw. Compare that to the cat skull. Here's where the, it's a little lower jaw fits in. It has a little paddle right there and it bites down. It can it can sort of resist resist its jaw coming out. Bear, it has a bit of a bit of a buttress here to stop that jaw from coming out, but the jaws come out no problem. And then compare this to something like a herbivore, and there's almost nothing holding that jaw in. You'll notice that when it's feeding, it moves its jaws side to side. Okay, if you think here, here the here are the badger, the muscles grow up to about here, and then they, they don't get any bigger. Whereas in the in the wolverine, they grow up and get bigger and, and they're even leaving the skull and the sagittal crest is a response to those muscles being so big. So the, these incisors are actually a bit sort of diamond shaped. So they have multiple cusps. So like extra cusps on the, on the left and right or the mesial and lateral uh, sides of, of the teeth. And this is meant to help it sort of like 
like pick food. Once it opens, you can see where the, the canines <laughs> come into effect. So the, these massive, uh, massive teeth. The average mammal is a rodent. Most, <laughs> most. The first thing you'll notice, of course, are these enormous incisors. And these incisors have a color to them, right? So they have orange on the outside and white on the inside. And what they've done is they've put their enamel more on the outside of the tooth and it's more dentine on the inside of the tooth. So as it's growing, the teeth are just curving out and as they're chewing, that hard enamel wears less than the soft dentine. So these front teeth can actually chisel into the tooth and they're ever sharpening right, right, right through the whole diastema. And so this is one of the ex most extreme uh, forms of, of, of sort of tooth heterodonty in mammals where they have just a couple teeth on the front that are chisels ever growing and an, a battery of teeth on the back that all look the same but, 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 but completely different from the chisel teeth on the front. These guys uh, have such different teeth than, than any, any mammal we've seen so far. And you can tell right away these teeth, they're, they're sort of like, like leaf shaped. So multiple cusps uh, in a row. And this is a classic dentition for fish eating mammals and fish eating animals for that matter. And this is a vampire bat. And so right away, you can see why they call it a vampire bat. It's, it's completely uh, expanded its, its canines into these blades. And so, so of course, vampire bats feed on blood almost exclusively. Okay, so um, Professor Longson. <laughs> I'm gonna do a blooper roll as well. <laughs>